Okay, this is going to be a quick video on how to populate a desktop GARP experiment. And this would be the same for any uh, experiment using any data set. So I'm just going to use uh, some of my own data uh, to get this populated and then give you some tips and tricks for how to populate your own and you'll be off and running. The first thing we need to do is populate uh, our uh, experiment here with our input data. So for example here after running the uh, GARP tools to prepare data. I have a training data set and my testing data set. Okay, and uh, this is a pretty extensive database, so it's taking a moment to load. Okay, but I have a great deal of data here. Okay, and so here you can see uh, I have uh, 10 different years of data because uh, I have 10 experiments, right, uh, sorry, 10 uh, draws of all the data from this particular year and in each I have 261 uh, unique spatial locations. Okay, So I'm going to say I uh, use 50% for training and uh, that would split that equally, 130 and 131, for example. Okay. 130 to build the models each iteration and 131 uh, to, to test the models. Okay. If I had a lower sample size, I might change this to say at least some uh, minimum number of training points. Okay. Uh, additionally, I might also increase this number to 75, I have such a large sample size that uh, I'll build with more data and, and test with fewer. Okay, So uh, we'll set this at 75%, we'll set it to 200 models, and we'll leave these other parameters, the convergence and iterations limits the same. We'll use all four rule types because we want to maximize desktop GARP as a superset of models, meaning it can build multiple types of rules. So if we started turning those on and off, we'd be uh, changing how many rules, uh, rule types GARP could use. We're going to set <coughs> the best subset to active. This means that we're going to build up to 200 models. Each run equals a model. We're going to set it to extrinsic because we have real testing data that are being withheld from the model. So extrinsic says uh, use those holdout data from the internal training and testing split populated here and set a hard omission threshold of 10 percent. That means for any model to be considered part of the best subset it must have an omission of 10 percent or less, meaning that it's predicting with 90 percent accuracy or better predicting those holdout data. If it's not predicting the internal testing data that we just defined here at 90% or better, then it's thrown out of this best subset. And we're going to tell it out of the possible 200, run until you have 20 models that meet the omission criteria. So once that criterion of 10% is met, we select those 20 models. Then it says take 50% of those 20. So that's how we arrive at 10 best models in the subset, is by taking the 50 percent of those or the 10 of those that are closest to the median commission value. So we've got a 10 percent hard omission and now a 50 percent commission distribution and uh, there are slides on this that I've already uh, sent to users to better understand that uh, omission commission relationship. Okay? So now we've got our models populated with input data and how we're going to subdivide it We've got our optimization parameters, how we're actually going to run the models, and now we need to give it our environmental layers.
So for our environmental layers, I went to data set, scan directory, and I've navigated to where I keep my ASCII files. And here I have a DXL. If you go back and watch the video on how to populate data set manager and build a GARP environmental coverages set, uh, I've described that in another video. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and grab this. And now I can see all of my environmental variables. So now I have my environmental data set. Here I'm using a series of NDVI and soils variables. Here I have my input data for the description of my occurrence points defined as 75% of these data for training, 25% uh, for internal uh, testing, which is going to populate the best subset procedure. I'm using at least 200 runs. I need at least 200 so that I can find 20 good models. Also, this is going to build 10 individual uh, GARP runs, one for each, 2004-1, 2004-2, 2004-3, and so on. So that says that for each one of those, build a new uh, GARP experiment and run a new best subset procedure. So just by populating this the way I have, I'm going to end up with 10 GARP experiments being run sequentially. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on through 10. Okay, if all I had was a single data set just called 2004 with the 261 points, I'd only arrive at one best subset. So basically what I've done here is just allowing GARP to run a whole suite of experiments for me rather than having to repopulate GARP to do this over and over again. Okay. Now, uh, for our outputs, notice here we have this box that I have ignored so far called projection layers. Okay, notice it says already besides the training data set. Okay, it's automatically going to build a GARP projection of presence absence from this data set automatically because it's populated here in the layers. So I don't need to add it here. However, notice here this is for a specific year, 2004. If I had an additional year, 2005 or 2010 or 2017, then I could add that here and make a projection from this 2004 model onto the 2017 climate data. I'm not doing that in this particular experiment, so I'm going to leave that blank because I'm automatically going to get a native model for this data set that's loaded. The last thing we need to do is define our output. Bitmaps are useless. They're just image files and you can't analyze them. ASCII grids uh, require an additional processing step in R. We're going to skip those. We're going to write out the ARC info grids. This is going to give us uh, a set of grids for each model produced under this uh, setting here, up to the total number required to find 20. So oftentimes GARP doesn't require all 200 runs to arrive at 10 models uh, in a best subset. It could be 100, it could be 110, it could be 120, and so it'll stop once it hits 20. And if we select the radio button for best subsets, then we should end up with our uh, an individual directory of just the best subsets uh, in addition to a folder of all the models. Okay. Now the next thing I need to do is come up with an output directory. By default it says C temp. This is where there is a bug. Okay. So what I'm going to do just for this example is go onto my C drive and create a folder called GARP output. And this is just temporary for, for demonstration. Okay. And then I'm going to create a folder, and this is how you should create your own folders, called GARP Runs. And then I'm going to create a folder called Run1. Okay. So now I have a folder called GARP Runs Run1. Now I'm going to put the lowercase letter A right here under file name. Okay. This is the bug. I've put the letter A and now I'm going to delete it. Okay. 
In your own experiments, you should be replacing this GARP output folder with wherever your file directory is. Then you should have a GARP runs folder and a run folder for each model run. Now the reason I do this is that each model run is going to end up with its own set of best subset folders and its own uh, subset of models that you may go in and, and use for other analysis. With each sequential run, uh, I go in and create a little readme file inside that tells me about what's inside of that run folder. Okay, okay so deleting that lowercase a was essential uh, for making this output directory string run the way I want it to. Okay. So now I can go up and say model run and I'm going to get this warning I'm going to create more than 2,000 tasks. That's because I have uh, so many different data sets here and that's fine. We're just going to say okay we know it's going to create a lot. Then it's going to navigate me to through the save as step here. It's going to navigate me into that run one folder. If you do not put that letter A and delete it uh, what you'll end up doing is writing all of your files a directory above where you think your files are being created and this is going to create a real mess. So that putting that letter there is a critical workaround to keeping yourself organized. Okay, And I'll call this run1. And sometimes I'll give myself little notes. For instance, I might say uh, Chobi2004. That's the particular uh, data set I'm running. And now I'm off and running and creating a model. And we'll let this run, and then you're ready to pick up the next